Is Sammy not to be coming here? When I clean, right? Sammy, I thought Sammy was supposed to be coming here. No, feel it. No, when you go this way, feel it. Ah, uh, that means. Sense. I don't know if it's like. I think that's I'm, maybe when it moves to the left, it's moving. So that's probably the extent over here. So let's try to move it this way. That's it. See? Yeah. Try that right now. That's better. Yeah. So if you feel that resistance, just adjust the bo the bottom. Yeah, the track yeah. bottom. Right.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Today we will tune our voices and sing hymn number seven. Um, One moment. Hymn number eight. If you could just. Go ahead, John. If you could just join us in song. Jesus is 
Jesus is coming again. We want to thank everyone for being here. Those of you who are here, the less than 10, they will have about 8. We are expecting one or two more. And we thank those who are watching us from their homes, from the comfort of their homes. Yeah, we're also comfortable here, so just, it's not just you that's comfortable there. We're also comfortable here. Yes. And uh, maybe if the lockdown continues, we'll see the schedule will get to you and then you can join us here one of the Sabbath mornings. We thank God for the week that will be ending this evening. We, we have had ups and we've had downs. We've had people who we are positive few days, few weeks ago, but now we thank God that they are now in the negative. Mm, amen. And then unfortunately, we also have uh, uh, one or two positive within the week, but they are doing very well. I think we are rest assured that it's not going to go into, into a crisis mode, so we're still going to be all right. We want to thank God for His grace. Uh, we are we believe that very soon this uh, this uh, uh, pandemic will be over, and uh, even though we may not go back to our full normal scale as it used to be, because this has really been a change in all the things we do. But we believe God has a purpose, and don't forget, we should we we will be too comfortable for a while, and sometimes some of us are trying to forget that uh, this is not our home. We are. Uh, and we are relaxing, we are doing everything as if uh, this is our home. This is actually not our home. When we sent your child, your son, your daughter to college, a college of four years, at the end of four years, you should expect the child to graduate and get into something else. And uh, you don't expect your child to remain in college forever. Yeah. So the purpose of the degree is to use it for something and something and something and so on. So we, we came here, we are born, we grew, we are growing, we we were not supposed to be here forever. How old are you now? Every day you ask something. Every day you ask something. You are going down to the purpose for which you were created. Our creation didn't say that uh, we are created to remain here. This is not our home. So we are going somewhere else. So we shouldn't lose focus of that. Maybe, maybe uh, the Lord is using this as a point of contact to draw us closer and to remind us that this world is not our home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath of today. Thank you for a bright Sabbath morning. Thank you for those who are here. And thank you for those who are at home watching and participating in the Sabbath worship of today. We ask for special blessings upon each and every one of us. We thank you for healing those that you have healed. And thank you for the healing process that is going on for those who are still ill and recovering. Thank you for comfort for those that have lost their loved ones and their families, their friends, their relatives. We ask that the Holy Spirit will comfort each and every one of us. We want to thank you for a special blessing that you have prepared for us. First of all, we want to ask that you forgive our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we regard iniquity in our heart, you have said, the Lord will not hear. So we ask that you take us to the feet of the cross and remove the burden of sin from us, cleanse us, present us afresh and anew before you are thrown. Then we can worship you and we will accept our worship, we will accept our praise. As we go into here, I want you this morning to study the Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. Teacher from above, open our eyes of understanding so that we can see deeper things in your world. And at the end of our study today, draw us closer to you than ever before. Prepare us for your soon coming. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are on lesson number four. Lesson number four. So if you have your quarterlies, I will ask that you uh, get your quarterlies out. And then uh, if you are watching with the with your phone, so you might need the hard copy of the Bible, not the one you pull from the phone, since you might be using the phone. If you are watching from your TV, then yeah, you can now use your phone and then we'll look at some of the scriptural references we're going to look into today. Lesson number four. Remember the topic for the quarter. It simply says how to interpret 
the scripture, how to interpret the scripture. And we are lesson number four for today. And the topic for lesson number four is the Bible, the authoritative source of our theology. The Bible, the authoritative source of our theology. And uh, just to give you a heads up, next week, lesson number five, we will have a guest speaker who is going to be speaking, handling that lesson number five. So you, you are invited. You're going to get someone, special person coming in next Sabbath, who's going to handle lesson number five, which the topic, if you remember, is just going to be lesson five. is saying by the scripture alone. By the scripture alone. All right, lesson number four. Let's go. The every text. Is from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, which says mm -hmm. to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. So Isaiah is saying here, anyone who speaks, doesn't matter his portfolio, his degree, whatever, whatever. Anything he speaks concerning the scripture, if it doesn't conform with the law and the testimony, if it doesn't agree with the law and the testimony, it is because that the, in Philadelphia we say the people is out. So you don't have light. And so if you don't have light, then darkness, because there's no light in them, it has no authority. So the person could be well educated. But if his assumption, if his statement, Declaration is believed doesn't conform with the law and the testimony in the scriptures because there's no light in them. So the Bible, the authoritative source of our theology, the Bible next week, the Bible and the Bible alone next week. Okay, let's go in and see. So there is no Christian church in the whole world. There's no Christian church in the whole world that doesn't use the scripture as the support of their belief. In other words, if you get into the Catholics, they will tell you it's the Bible. If you get into the Baptist, the Bible, the Methodist, the Bible, the Jehovah Witness, the Bible, the Seventh-day Adventist, the Bible, everybody just says the Bible is the Constitution. Everybody says so. Okay. So, but today we're going to look at five things that are very important. Well, the, the, the Sabbath introduction says that we are going to be studying five different influential sources. Five different influential sources that impact our interpretation of scripture. Five things in all of us. We have seven billion people. My Lord, those who have died, I don't have a lot of time. So if you have seven billion people on earth and they have to interpret the scripture, there are five things that that interpretation will be based upon. Number one is tradition. Number two is experience. Three, culture. Four, personal reason, individual reason, rational or rational reasons. And the last one is the Bible itself. So five things. He says again, tradition, experience, culture, reason, and the Bible itself. Based upon these five things, we are, including me, Interpret the scripture. Any of those five could influence our understanding of the scripture. Any of those. So, at the end of today's lesson, we'll be able to see which one really influences us. It's possible you might be influenced, we might be influenced by more than one. It could be culture or tradition. It could be culture and the Bible. It could be tradition and the Bible. It could be reason for some of us who are philosophical. But as I said, we'll be able to see that these five things will control how we apply the scripture. So let's move on to the first one. That's what the lesson. Tradition. What is tradition? Alright, you can define it the way you like. You can call it however you want to call it. But I want to give you examples that will give you an idea. Uh, we'll be getting PowerPoints ready very soon when we can stream and then put things on the screen for everyone to see. But for now that we don't have it, let us look at examples of things that you will remember that are just a little bit traditional. Traditional. Now, when I ask you, let us pray. 
Naturally, tradition will tell you you need to close your eyes, right? Mm. It, it, that's not scriptural. You don't have it anywhere in the scripture. But just tell your kids right now, let's pray. You see all them before their eyes. Why are they being taught to obey that tradition? They will want to pray. You want to avoid distraction. I mean, it depends on what you call distraction. Because what distracts me might not distract you. But what we do, we, we unconsciously just close our eyes. No, we say, let's pray. So we Christian, tell me where you know that I'm Christian. Before their eyes and then they pray. That's traditional. We used to it. Over time, it has become part of our habit. Okay, you remember the accused Jesus that uh, why is it that your disciples don't obey the, the tradition of our fathers? Mm. And Jesus said, wait a minute, what tradition? The way they eat it, they just came down there eating without washing hands. Oh, let's have a look See this, he says, that life is better than clean hands, right? Yeah. But that's what the Bible says, they you have a clean hand, that whatever. What we hear in this thing, the law says in the scripture. But we are not putting the Bible that God said, hey, you are the clean hands. No, we are putting CDC, right? Mm -hmm. Life is better with the clean hands. And coronavirus has made you to wash your hands. But you know what? This tradition that we say so before you have to wash your hands, brush your teeth, this is scriptural. But we don't put the scripture. We rely on tradition. Because our people say so. CDC says so. The life is best. So we don't put the scripture. So we obey it. Not because the Bible said it, but because it's tradition. And then, of course, you know the bad days. There were two bad days celebrations in the Bible. The first one was celebrated by who? Remember, my father. That was when Joseph was crowned the prime minister. And the second one was celebrated by who? By Herod. That was when they beheaded John the Baptist. That's all. No more bad days. But we do bad days. Right. Of course. So what are you doing? Try the shop. Tradition itself is not bad. It gives we are calling acts in our daily lives as a certain routine and structure. So tradition itself is not bad. Right? Close the eyes, let's pray. It's not bad to close eyes. So if you can't focus when your eyes are open, if you don't wash your hand and eat, we will call 911 to pick you to the hospital. I mean, those are good traditions. That's all. Bad days, brush your teeth, you celebrate Easter. What are you doing? Tradition, they used to eat with what we Christmas is anniversaries. If, however, if human traditions becomes, now, look, 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 let's, let's go back a little bit. This is tradition, they used to eat. It's not the real one. The Bible didn't command it. The scripture didn't say do it. But we are, we are used to it. So now, now they are done. You wash your hand, even though we know that uh, being temperance, temperance being that you have to do everything in moderation. Mm -hmm. Even if you want to wash hand, wash in moderation. Okay. But if a tradition becomes more respected or becomes on equal level, with the word of God, now it renders the word of God of no effect. Let, let me go back again. If you hold your, your birthdays of more sacred than the Sabbath, now the day we are born, first January, whatever, that's your birthday. If you respect that day more than the birthday of creation, the seventh day Sabbath, now that's a problem now. So tradition itself is not bad. But when you hold it for more extreme than the word of God, now you have another God before, before God. So it's something that we need to um, be careful how we do our how we apply our tradition, comparing it with the word of God. So when you hold your tradition to be on the same level or above the word of God, you are not going to have a because you are now honoring something above God. So, tradition is good, but don't forget, there's always a limit, there's always a boundary. When the tradition comes in conflict with the word of God, be careful. I told you a story about the time we were trying to hold the evangelistic service. Our major team that happened to fall upon the Sabbath, and we were to start before the sun sets to carry on the evangelism till the dawn. But the, the, the most important figure that we're using to reach the community happened to be a lover of soccer. Unfortunately, that Sabbath, his soccer team 
was playing. He wasn't going over overseas to watch the team. He would just go and sit down in his home and watch it on TV. But I was saying, that guy didn't come to church because the soccer team was playing that day. In other words, soccer was his tradition. He enjoyed soccer. That's his hobby. But it happened to fall upon the Sabbath when we needed him for something. No, so he, he ditched us for that tradition. So if your tradition, soccer is not bad. But when you when you honor soccer more than the word of God, when you honor soccer or you attend to soccer footballs and the word of basketballs, baseballs, you honor them more than the word of God. Now there is a problem with that. So the Bible, the Bible holds a unique role that surpasses all human tradition. The Bible stands higher and above all tradition, even the good ones. So you may have good tradition, good they are very good, but don't forget, the Bible stands higher above all. So whatever is your hobby, whatever is your tradition, never you place it above the word of God. When you do that, you are having a problem. The question on Sunday says, what are the things we do as a church? Mother's Day, Father's Day, Children's Day, Women's Day, Men's Day, whatever you are doing, these are all traditions. But never you forget, those should come above the word of God. The word of God is supreme, that's all. Everything comes from that. There's nothing wrong with Mother's Day, Father's Day, Children's Day, Animal Day, day, day. whatever day you are doing, no problem. But they should always be under the word of God. The word of God reigns supreme, and that is it. That's why I said next week we'll get more about the Bible and the Bible alone. Money lesson tells us about the second one there, experience. Experience. Now, now let, let, let's come home. If you have seen a victim, somebody who has contracted coronavirus and it is severe, and you see the person battling, um, I don't know, you need to have a divine inspiration to remain normal. Emotionally, no. Because you see your brother, your sister, your loved ones, and that pain, excruciating pain, it hurts. Imagine a mother watching the little child dying in her arms. It hurts. And some of us have not had such experience. So sometimes it is easy to always sit back and say, I will pray for you. When you don't really know what that person is passing through, and it is easy to condemn someone and say, Your friend is weak. Because it hasn't really come close to your doors. Mm. So experience sometimes can affect and alter the way we see things. We, we may be seeing things as if they are normal. But when that thing comes knocking on your own door, now you see it differently from two days ago. So experience is really something that we need to be very careful. If we don't allow the scripture to interpret our experience. You lose a loved one, you can get angry with God. We, we had a, a church where there was almost a division, where the assistant pastor, I'm not talking about a man member, an elder, a deacon, no, 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 an assistant pastor of the church happened to lose someone. Oh, I have attended funerals where that man spoke at funerals of other people. He spoke eloquently, it was good. And so, so jumped up and rejoiced and they gave their life to Christ. Unfortunately, his wife died. But okay, what happened? The wife was heavy, traveled to one of the islands and uh, got sick over there before he could be contacted and he flew over to get the wife pastor. He was so angry. And the members came to console him to do what the Lord said. No, he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know how I feel. That was emotional. That was emotional. And then it took a long while to bring him back. Okay. Remember, that's the pastor who had been preaching in other people's funeral. Mm. But now he came close to him and he couldn't grow his emotions again. He was almost denying God, right? Mm. Another brother lost their son. A male child of two years old. Okay, that was the only child. Yeah. Remember, I didn't say one child. The only child. And of course, the church went to console as usual. So the doctor's taking it and No, you have got to. The only thing he gave me, he took it away just two years old. He could have allowed him to. And then, in the heat of passion, one of the leaders of the church that went for the consolation, for the comfort.
fourth nation, God has given the prayer. God, you, you are causing God. No, that's not the time to do that. You see, two laws are not making right, right? Right. The, 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 the guy just had a experience that could alter his faith. And you that was sent to restore him, be careful what he do. Now, they were not angry. And we, they were holding him. He said, Slow down. No, I will slow down. You just have what he said. You just take it easy. His experience is passing through some university of tears. He will graduate. But you, don't forget, you're supposed to be the instructor to teach him how to graduate. Don't, 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 don't impede his success. So experience is something that we need to be very careful. The experience here, the right arrives. The experience is part of our human existence. It impacts our feeling and our thoughts in a powerful way. Now, there are different kinds of experience that God desires us to have with him. Experience of the beauty of relationship with God. And of course, I would used to tell me the young guy who went to heaven alive for the first time. You know the first guy who went to heaven alive. His name is Paul Enoch. He was worshiping God like everyone. He was close to God like everyone. However, when his first child was born, his name was Methuselah. Mm -hmm. Enoch looked at the boy and saw how beautiful the young boy, just as we have beautiful when they were born new. And then Enoch was captivated in love of the beautiful, helpless, beautiful boy. And then Enoch took special interest in the boy. Whatever the boy wants, Enoch was there to provide. So he got too close to the boy that one day he was looking at and evaluating his relationship with his son. And he said, well, wait a minute. If I love this small thing as much as this, who knows how much my heavenly father lost me. God was listening to the heart of Enoch and saw that Enoch understood his relationship based on the miniature one he had with his son, with his son. And that evening, God came and called him, come and let him walk. And they were all walking. And they were all walking. And they passed the boundary. And they walked. Then Enoch realized they passed the boundary and said, I have passed the boundary to go back. Come on, man. let's go, let's go. And of course, Enoch walked to heaven and I, why? Because he understood the experience of the beauty of relationship. So which means when you have a relationship with God, there is a kind of experience that you can pass on to people. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2 verse 4 that we shouldn't despise God's goodness, God's forbearance, God's forgiveness, God's kindness and God's love because it is His goodness that leads us to repentance. So it means that it is when we get into that experience, that relationship with God, it leads us to repentance. And of course, some experiences are not good, like what we just mentioned about people losing their loved ones, coronavirus, even when you pray for healing, God brings death, and you say, well, what did it happen now? We shouldn't forget. Romans 8, 28, all things, all things work together for good. It didn't say some things work together, it said all things. Paul said, if it's alive, it's to God's glory. If I die, then I gain. So all things work together for good. God has brought us to school. He knows when we graduate. So some experience might be deceiving. Some experience might be deceiving, but it doesn't really matter for God. What matters is you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 to 3, I want to read. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 3. Word to God, you will be here with me a little in my folly. And indeed, there with me, Paul is saying, I, I, I want to behave like as if I'm foolish, but I want you to tell me right mm -hmm. about bad experience. So he said, verse 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, so that I might present you as a just virgin to Christ. Now look at verse 3, but I fear, mm -hmm. lest by any means, any means, wow. that as the serpent, the God Eve, through his subtlety, so your mind should not be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. We are talking about negative experience. And Paul is saying, I am afraid, so that the devil will not use some of these negative experience to corrupt your mind. Mm -hmm. Because it happens not the way you think. And sometimes you say, Didn't God say he's going to heal me? He said he's going to heal me. And they, no. Be careful. The devil could be using some of those negative experiences that you have to twist 
their belief and their faith. You have not forget. All things work together. All things. Well, once the scripture is no longer your standard, then your experience will lead you to being taken far away from God. We need to be very careful about that so we must rest upon God's word. Whether it is positive today or not. Whether it is true or not. Before Elijah, Elijah went to the woman of Zelephant, you know she had been having psychological problems, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know she wanted to see her psychologist, right? You know she wanted to see because she had a problem. She looked at the thing, it's going down. What are we going to eat? The food was still in the menu, but she was thinking about what? She was thinking about how to pay her bills. The, the, the autumn loan, how to put the car. The, the, the more thing is there, the rent is there. But she was thinking. Like every, one of, every one of us would think. But she didn't need to worry. If she had only known what God was planning, she would have been worried. But like you and I, she can't see the future. But for us, we, we know who holds the future. And the Bible says, Don't worry. Yeah, experience might not be sweet. Might not be as beautiful as mine. Yeah. Neither will it be as worse as mine. But don't worry. Put your hope and trust in God. And the Lord will see it through. She is a lesson. Culture. Now, man. This is a big one. The question here is, is the Bible cultureless? What I mean cultureless? Does it mean that the Bible doesn't have a culture? Now, if you say yes, that the Bible is cultureless, you will forget that the, the much of the Old Testament was just a story of a culture. It was the culture of Nigerians or Americans. It was the culture of the Jewish people. So if you say yes, the Bible is not the culture that we're in there. But what was the Old Testament was about them? Some of the things Paul wrote, the women shouldn't be allowed to speak in church. He wanted to talk about American women. So he must have been talking about culture in some areas. And of course, if you also say the Bible is not, is is not cultural. Then, of course, you will be able to know that when we did the first Passover, the first communion service that Jesus had, they said, this is the last one, I'm going to hold another one with you in the kingdom, that they were washing their feet. But, I don't know what feet would be sustained to their house. So that was the culture of that. For some time, they did not still wash feet. They don't wash feet because of the culture of Americans or Africans, or Asians, or Australians. No, we don't, we don't wash feet because that's our culture. We wash feet because we are trying to take it as an ordinance of humility. So we don't call it feet washing uh, ceremony. No, we call it, it ordinance of humility. So it becomes a tradition to show a humility. That's it. It's not a tradition. But then, if you go into the Word of God, then the Word of God is, even though it was given in a specific culture, but it is not limited to one culture because it was sent from a certain culture to reach the whole world. Let me give you another example. God spoke to God Abraham. He said, I'm going to bless you. I, I won't just bless you temporarily. I'm going to make your name great and you are going to be a source of blessing to who? To the whole world. So, which is even though God was talking to Abraham in a limited culture, but the purpose, the aim, is to use that blessing for all generations. So it started with culture, but suddenly it became cultureless, and it can go to everyone. However, if we allow culture, don't forget, all cultures are not good. So cultures align with the scripture. Cultures are pure with the scripture. How your father and mother are different people, how many different, different cultures? Don't tell the children to go to jail for child abuse. There are some cultures. We look at it that way. And then the other one says, if you spend it all, this one thing, culture. Just be careful how you do it and know what applies where you go. If you if you practice in Asia and Africa, you come to America and you do it, you will join me in prison. Now, culture is involved. So, so some cultures might be good, aligned with the word of God. That's all right, wrong with it. But when a culture conflicts, be careful. Again, even when we apply culture, we should be careful, just like tradition. We don't place culture above the word of God. First John chapter 2, 15 to 16. Love not the world. Yeah, you come from Nigeria, you have Nigerian culture. You, you come from Jamaica, you have Jamaica culture. You come from America, Canada, you have culture. Yes, I agree with you. But love not the world. All the things in the world. 
the, the approach of the on death, the word of God, not a whole. The loss of the eyes, the loss of flesh, part of that. It's all cultural. The clothes we wear in America, not the clothes we wear in Africa, not the clothes we wear in Asia, have different things, different cultures. The way you greet them, not the way they greet in Asia, not the way they greet. It's different cultures. But whatever you do, your culture must come under the submission of the word of God. Do not set your mind on the things of the world. Let your mind be set on the culture that is heavenly. Even though you live in the world, but you are not of the world. So some cultures are very good. We should be very careful. Most of us were raised in cultures where we see God as a tyrant. Because our enemy fathers are tyrants. They come in and bad the water. Do this, do that. Now when we read the word of God, thou shall not. So when you speak like the Father. Now you misunderstand God's law. So sometimes culture might be positive, and sometimes culture might be negative. Look at what Eliwa wrote in uh, the council to parents, teachers, and students. Page 3 to 3. The last paragraph of Jesus said here. Followers of Christ are to be separate from the world in principle and interest, but they are not to isolate themselves from the world. Remember, a salt and light are supposed to be mingled with the people. The set of mingled constantly with men, not to encourage them in anything that was not in accordance with God's will, but to uplift and ennoble them. In other words, Jesus mingled with them. He wasn't there to join them in their negative culture if it contradicts God's word. But he was just there to encourage them and to help them to understand it better. Sometimes cultures might be good, but the application might be wrong too. Mm -hmm. If you are going to force in on force into a pit on the Sabbath, yeah, you have pity on the goat and you bring the goat out. But then your yeah, brother falls sick on the Sabbath and says, no, 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 we'll go to hospital until, until sunset. Come on now. We don't have to talk about But no, 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 So sometimes, sometimes the culture can be good, but the way we apply it might be negative. So let's not forget cultures and cultures are good, but application is very important. Where is the lesson? Reason. Now, I like this one. I like this one. Reason. 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 Where is the lesson? Let's see, Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, we're talking about wisdom, right? Yeah, reason. The fear of the Lord is just the beginning. It's not the end, it's not the middle. They're just starting, right? It's just starting. So that means that you still have more classes and more credits to get. But, but fools don't like wisdom. And the fools don't like instruction. Mm -hmm. Fools don't like wisdom. Red light. The traffic lights supposed to stop. But when you're in a hurry, you don't like it. Because it makes a good purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes fools don't like wisdom and they despise instruction. So the Bible says about 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 5 and 6, which says, casting down arguments. And every high thing that exhausts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought, every reason into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience. Being ready to punish all disobedience. Mm -hmm. Only when you are all obedience is guaranteed to fail. In other words, Abraham asked Jesus, or oh, you remember the three angels came to meet Abraham, right? And uh, after they finished eating, two of them went on and one remained behind. And they were going to hold that right? And then after telling Abraham they were going to destroy Solomon and God, Abraham asked the question, come on, man. I, I thought the judge of the whole earth cannot do wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, that was like a statement. I'm not going to be judge of the whole earth do wrong. And I believe Jesus said, what do you mean by that? Can I not destroy the wicked and the righteous together? And you know, I didn't say I was going to do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't say I was going to do that. So what are you saying? If you find, okay, now, you know, the, the negotiation for souls, come on, evangelism, now. Yeah. <laughs> evangelism can you don't play. If you find that, if you find what of this? Because you are buying time. Everyone will buy time for salvation of soul. And that's what we should be doing. What do you need to find this in Philadelphia? What do you see this? So if you find that means you have to go to work. To get 50, you have to go to work for it. To get 10, you have to go to work for it. If you find, now, now what are we saying here? That you can only be ready to punish disobedience. Only when you are all obedient. It's fulfilled. You can 
they punish this, punish this someone for smoking marijuana when they are smoking cigarettes. Excuse me. They are all the same thing. They are being asked to fulfill. You look at a father and mother who smokes and their child wants to say, child, what are you doing? Stop that. What are you talking about? You just sent me to buy a cigarette for you. And you asked me to stop smoking. You want me to obey me, but you want me to obey? No. He has says here, bringing every talk, you are reasoning into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And then you can be able to punish disobedience only when they are only obedient. If you feel. And Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, this is very important. Say, keep your heart with all diligence. Because out of it, Spring the issues of life. Now, your heart means your reasoning chamber, your thoughts, the place that actions are formulated. Because before an action takes place, it can be talked over in one way. So the heart becomes the center of where you put your war battles and your weapons together before you discharge them. So, reason, going back to the lesson again, reason means that your thoughts, if your thoughts, are not good. Their conclusions will also not be good. Because what you are thinking is negative. So the outcome of it, the heart is so deceptive above all things. Remember the Bible says so. Because it is in the heart that those rational or irrational thought comes out. Before it goes out, when a man goes out to shoot somewhere, the police want to find the motive. What the motive? The reason? What was he thinking about? What was his plan? The motive. So your motive is very important. So what are the kind of human reasons that are for? So our sometimes our human rationalisms are not so good. Don't forget, never you forget that human reason was also affected when man sinned, right? So our reasons became negative when man sinned. So man is reason. How could God create all these things in six days? Don't you think that you guys you guys made that up? And of course, by human reason, the world is full of a lot of things. How could we have made it in six days? So when we said God commanded the camp to be, when it took how many years to manufacture a car, when the one was the first airplane, no one the first car, everyone was flying by ship. Was it the kind of ship? No, it must have been a packed boat. Not this kind of comfortable boat we are getting. And no. That means the, the human reason tells you that no, God could have made the whole thing in six literal days. Could have been in six billion days or six whatever days. That is human reasoning. How were you telling me that a woman gave birth and she was still a virgin? That is the virgin birth of Jesus. Human reason thing to think. He resurrected. How, how, how is that possible that there is resurrection? So sometimes there are a lot of things that human reasoning try to fight and argue with. They don't believe in it because they don't understand it. So we know that the word of God is powerful to us who are being saved. But to those who are dying, it is foolishness. So our human reasoning and our thoughts are going to lead us astray. But if we, like we read in Second Chronicles, in Second Corinthians, if we submit our argument and bring every thought into Captivity and into obedience of Christ, then we mean that our thoughts, our mind, our thinking would conform to God's will. But if our thought is only what we think from what we read from those books, then our chances are that our decisions, our actions will be based on those things that are not in conformity with the word of God. So we need to be really careful where our thoughts are. And then finally, on Thursday lesson, Thursday lesson. The Bible. Remember, we talked about the tradition, we talked about experience, we talked about culture, and we talked about reason. That's four. Tradition, experience, culture, and then we talked about reason. Now we are moving to the last one, which is the best one. The last things are said best. Remember, we ask this question. If you are a secretary and uh, your boss comes to work and you have three messages to deliver, how, in what order are you going to give those messages? You start giving them as the important goes first. The average important comes next. And then the most important comes last. Mm -hmm. If the, the man's wife is involved in an accident, if their boss is a man, 
The man of God is involved in an accident, and there is a check in the sign to renew the lease that is almost expiring, and there is also another letter that goes to their leadership. You may be able to start with the letter that goes to the leadership. The man signs the letter, and it's fine, it's gone. Then you present the lease, sir, don't worry. We already have 11 days maintenance. You know, we have three more days before we pay um, late fee. Okay, where's the check? They signed the check. And then he wants to say, sir, sorry, they, they said their work wasn't involved in us. What? Involved in what? Now, if you have told him that the first time, you won't sign the letter, you won't sign the check, you're going to pass from the office. All those ones, so you're going to pay the fee for the mortgage. The letter will not go where it's supposed to go. So you start from the, the smaller one. And then you go up to the maximum. So the best is always safe for the last. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. If you read John chapter 2, you know that Jesus knew he was going to change water into wine, but that was done in last after the guys have already. You know that. So the best for the last. So we discussed about tradition. We talked about the experience. We talked about culture and reason. Now let's get the best now. You see how it goes, right? Mm -hmm. The best. The Bible. The Bible. The highest testing standard of all seasons. The Holy Scripture, the Holy Spirit, who has revealed and inspired the content of the Bible to human beings, will never lead us contrary to God's word or lead us astray from the word of God. Which means the Holy Scripture becomes the highest. The Seventh day Adventist believes that the Bible has a higher authority. That human tradition, human experience, human reason, or human culture. The Bible alone is the norm by which everything else needs to be tested. The Bible alone. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture, good and bad. Remember? All were inspired, but all are not inspiring. You remember we talked about it two summers ago. All the scriptures were all inspired, but all of them are not inspiring. Some things are not so good there. But God put everything in there, both good, the bad, the ugly, are all in there. Why? All scriptures are given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness. So that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the division of souls and spirit, and of joy and marrow, and is a designer of the thoughts and intent of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked. And open to the eyes of him to whom we must all give account. Whether you are an accountant or whether you are a police officer or a correctional officer, we will all give account to what the word of God says. That's become the highest standard. In John chapter 5, that is 39, Jesus said, Search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have what? Eternal life. And they are they who testify of the word of God. Remember the living word of God, Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, 17, 19, Jesus said, Don't think you have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I said to you, the heaven and earth passed away. One jot or one title shall in no means pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Okay? Verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach you him so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of God. So I'm going to be great. Yeah. I'm going to be great next. Because my mother says, no. Jump down from the moving plane, no. How can you be great? Teach them the word, the truth of God's word. And that the same shall be called great in God's kingdom. So here, if one claims that the Holy Spirit reveals something that contradicts the Bible, if one claims that the Holy Spirit has revealed to him or her something that contradicts the Bible, that claim is demonic. Paul and Peter said, if any man comes after us to say anything that is contrary to this world, let him be a cause, right? Yeah, they said so. If anybody comes after us God and says something that contradicts the word of God, then that person be a cause. There's something wrong with it. In John 15, verse 26, Jesus said, I'm going to send you the spirit of truth. 
and he's going to teach you what he gets from me. In John 16, 7 to 16, the Bible says the Spirit will speak of Christ, which means for everyone to say the Bible, the Holy Spirit and will be something that contradicts the Bible. That person needs to say a psychiatrist because something is completely wrong. So we mean here that if you compare our human tradition, compare our experience, whether positive or negative, you compare their culture and you compare their human reason, comparing them with the Bible, it means that the Bible should be the highest testing standard. So when we say the topic again on lesson number four, the Bible, the authoritative source of our theology, we say that on Christ the solid rock we stand. All other ground is what? A sinking sand. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it's because their people is dead. It's because there's no power, no electricity. So they are living in darkness. That is our lesson for today, lesson number four. Next week we'll be looking at lesson number five, which talks about by scripture alone, a continuation of what we have just studied. So we are going to have a, a guest speaker that will be treating the lesson number five for us next Sabbath. So if you're here, you'll be able to know how we can rely on the scripture and the scripture alone. And sometimes it's always easy for us to do certain quotations, certain good things, and, and quote them instead of the scripture. But all the basic quotes and all the basic things you need to train for family, for marriage, for whatever, they are all contained in the scripture. And I believe that if we keep the scripture as our basis, everything could be secondary. But use the scripture as your primary source of lectures. And then you can use all the sources you think are relevant. You can use them as your supplement. But your foundation should be based on the word of God. The, the song that says that I need no other evidence. I need no other place. It is enough that Jesus died for us. And all these are contained in the Holy Scriptures. So it's our plea, our prayer, that we make the Bible our authoritative source of our theology. When your argument is outside the Bible, then we will have a problem. But when your Bible, the argument is rest upon the Bible, let them say what they say. It may not make sense to them. It may not be rational. It may not be scientifically correct. But forget about it. The Lord will take care of it. Because somebody doesn't agree that the Sabbath is a Sabbath. That doesn't change how it is. Because somebody doesn't agree that the times of the new day starts when the sun goes down and wait until you don't that that doesn't change the fact. So just go ahead and stand upon the solid rock and the Lord will see us through in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we thank you for the lesson of today. We have studied the Holy Spirit with us that the work we have had will fell upon good ground that will bring fruit to your own glory. Pray fast for us. come we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. church family as we get into the second segment of our worship for today. The second part of our service we're going to be singing hymn 100. As we tune our voices, let us all sing together hymn 100. Thank you. 
next one and the last one we was 305.
Church of Heavenly Sabbath. Good morning, Church of Heavenly Sabbath. We've got announcements for today. Today is the second reading of membership transfer for Chico Wanchupu. Thank God, she is transferring from the Boulevard SDA Church to Germantown SDA Church. All right, uh, Sister Chica Wanchupu is transferring from Boulevard to the Germantown SDA Church. This is the second reading, so we will need a motion. Motion to be moved. Any second? Second. Second. Okay. Any questions? Leave that be known. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. It's carried. Thank you. There will be a prayer and fasting on Sunday, May 3rd, 2020, for all Boulevard members. Day four of total commitment to God. Prayer hours are 6 a.m., 9 a.m., 12 noon. 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. The prayer prayer line is 774-220-4000. Once again, that's 774-220-4000. And the access code is 114477. Once again, the access code is 114477. Boulevard is encouraging members to join our 40 days of prayer conference call every day from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. The church, sorry, the telephone number to call in is once again 774-220-4000 and the access code is 114477. The church board has approved the second part of the 40 days of prayer, which means that Boulevard may be praying for close to 100 days or more. Please call Elder Hollis or Sister Perry to order your 40 days of prayer booklet. We should continue to pray for one another and for our church family as we pass through this trying moment. We must also remember that God's presence gives us courage. As he tells us, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The Lord is our refuge. This is a reminder for all Boulevard members to watch Hope Awakens meetings online. An email was sent out to members with a link to log in. If you didn't get the email, please call Pastor Goodman or Elder Thanga. We also encourage members to write their wills or update their wills for free. To do so, call Bonnie Navarro. Please call Pastor Goodman for more information. Upcoming conference-wide events through June are canceled. This includes youth events, summer camp at Laurel Lake, PA conference camp meeting has also been canceled. Prayer request, Sister, Kem Sister Camille Donaldson lost her mother-in-law. Her name was Enid Donaldson and she passed away on March 14, 2020 at the age of 95. Please remember her family in prayer. Sister Enid also lost her father recently. Please remember her family in prayer as well. Sister Iris lost her brother also. Please remember her family in prayer. Prayer for the sick. Sister Maria Chimilio, Sister Christina, Sister Elizabeth Tusman, Sister Faith Beckford Ankle, Sister Rosalind Smith, and Brother Maxwell Darko's wife. Family ministry is requesting prayer for the following families. Pastor Buddy Goodwin and family, Belinda Goodwin, Benita Goodwin, Jade, Heaven, and Love Blake, Hat Elder Thank God, Oswabu and Family, Rosemary Thank God, Most High Thank God, and Tariro Mendiza, Victor Thank God and Family, Peace and Daniel Thank God. The family is also asking for a special prayer of protection for Most High as he is doing his military training in Virginia. Please remember him in training. Have a blessed Sabbath. boys and girls. I'm so happy to see you guys today, even though I can't see you, I know that you're there. So today I have an interesting story for you guys. It's called Sleeping in the Dark. So how many of you are scared to sleep in the dark? I'm sure most of you are scared to sleep in the dark. Okay, so when I was young, I was so, so scared to sleep in the dark, you guys. Like, I was so scared, and when I got older, my mom said to me, you have to learn to sleep with the light off. So when I go to bed, my mom would turn the light off, and my dad would come and turn it on for me, and that would make me feel better. So when my mom figured it out, my mom would be like to my dad, you can't turn your light on. So guess what? 
My bedroom was right in the hallway, so he would turn my light off, but turn the hallway light on. So I had light coming into my room, which made me feel so much better. You guys were so scared of the dark until I was like much older. So I'm going to tell you a story about this little boy. His name is Mitch, and Mitch was just like me, so scared of the dark. So Mitch's parents thought, okay, Mitch, you're getting much older, and you should learn to sleep in the dark. Even though it's scary, you should learn to sleep in your room, and when it's time for lights out, you should be able to go to sleep. So Mitch told them, I don't think I'm ready, I'm so scared, and they said, okay, just be a big boy, try. So that night, Mitch went to bed. He tried, he closed his eyes, he tossed and he turned, and it didn't work. And in less than two hours, knock, 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 on his parents' door, can I sleep with you, I'm so scared. So you know what, his parents said, all right, come on. And as the months went by, the parents were like, okay, no, this is not helping. We have to help Mitch to be able to be a big boy. So one Sabbath, Mitch went to church. And during his Sabbath school class, he learned that um, God is always there to protect us. Even when we seem scared, God is always there. So Mitch thought, you know what? Tonight I'm a big boy. So he told his parents, Mom and Dad, I can sleep by myself today. Don't even worry about it. So he went to sleep. And as he was sleeping or trying to sleep, he kept telling himself, God will protect me. God will protect me. God will protect me. Do you think he went to sleep? No. <laughs> even though he knew that God would protect him, he still was scared. So that morning, his parents were like, oh my goodness, yay, we went to sleep. And Mitch was like, oh, I can't sleep, I'm so scared. And they said, Mitch, you said you were a big boy. How? So you know what? The next Sabbath, Mitch went to church again, and then he heard an interesting verse. So he came back home and he said, okay, for real this time, I have a plan. I want you to get me a picture of Jesus. Even though I know that God will always protect me, if I have a picture in my room that I can at least see, I'll know that, okay, he's here, and when I get scared, I can look at the picture, I know, okay, fine, I have a picture, and he's also here. Oh my goodness, so his mom was calling her friend, she was so excited, Mitch's grandma brought a picture of Jesus. So Mitch looked at it, and he was like, mm, no, that's not a picture. <sighs> okay. So his mom went and got him a picture of Jesus. And Mitch was like, okay, I'll try to go to sleep with this picture. That night, oh my goodness, he didn't sleep again. So now his parents were like, okay, we're going to the mall and you have to pick up the picture of Jesus that you want. So they went to the mall and they saw one picture, they saw two pictures, three, four, five, a thousand pictures. And so Mitch was like, that one. I want the picture with Jesus Sparkly. So his friends were like, oh, okay, that's the picture that you want? Okay, we'll get it. And they went to the register, they paid for it, and they went home. And that day, Mitch put the picture in his room, his light was turned on, and he fell asleep. So the following morning, his parents were expecting that he didn't sleep, so they asked him, okay, Mitch, you didn't sleep, so what else can we do? And he said, no, I slept so well. And they said, how come? And Mitch said, remember that picture that I wanted with sparkling Jesus? It glows in the dark. <laughs> so even if I was sleeping in the dark, it wasn't that dark because Jesus was shining. <laughs> so guess what? That Sabbath before, when Mitch went to Sabbath school and he heard a verse, guess what verse he, he heard? Mitch heard John chapter 8, verse 12. That says, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Mm. So Mitch thought, I won't have to sleep in darkness because Jesus is the light of the world. Mm. And so he got this picture. And so even if you're afraid to sleep in the dark, even if it's Things that scare you in general, whether it's children or big people, the world can be so, so, so dark. It can be scary, it can be terrifying, or even things you're going through right now can be dark times. But just like Mitch, remember that Jesus is the light of the world. 
and he will guide your path, he will direct your path, and he will shine even when days seem dark. So now I want you guys to put your hands together, close your eyes as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being the light of the world. Thank you so much for always shining in our hearts. Help us to be the light like you and to shine across the world and to tell people all about you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your only son to die for us. Thank you. Help us to be good boys and good girls. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath.
sound in our ear. As we go to the Lord in prayer, we prepare our hearts before the Lord. Whether you want your knees or ready to sit, let's prepare to go before our King. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, Lord, thanking you for grace, Lord. Thanking you, Father God, for grace and mercy, Lord. Lord, we come into the God who created all things, Lord. We come into the God that created heaven and earth and the sea and all that are in them. In six days, and then on the seventh day, we rested. That's the God we're coming to. We're coming to the God who says, who can you compare me to? Who is like unto me? There is no other by and God, and there is no other. This is the God that we're coming to bow before, Lord God. Father, we come into the one Lord who said that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten Son. You allowed him, Lord, to be beaten and bruised and whipped and hung on the cross for our sins, Lord. But that should have been us on the cross, Lord. Dying the debt that we deserve for our sins, Lord. But you loved us so much you sent your son. Father, how much how could we thank you? A thousand times couldn't thank you enough, Lord God. Lord, we come ask you to forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for our sins and our trespasses, Lord, that we may have committed against you, Lord God. You say that we confess our sins, that you will be faithful and you will forgive us. But not only, only that, you said you would cleanse us of them. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. Make us a vessel of holy righteousness, Lord, that you be able to pour your spirit in, Lord God. Lord, also, we come and say, Lord, we ask you and pray that you would hear our prayer, Lord God. We submit our sins on the cross, Lord, that our humble hearts and our meditations that be acceptable to you, Lord, that you would hear our petition, Lord God. Father, we come in saying that we thank you in the midst of this trial and tribulation we've gone through, Lord. We know, Lord God, our worship service is limited, Lord, but you have left a door open, Lord, for us. You have not allowed the door to shut completely, Lord. We thank you for the door that you have left open, Lord. And you left it open for a reason, Lord God. It has shown us, Lord God, the importance of your word. For the congregation missed the fellowship of coming together worshiping you, Lord God. But now your scripture, Lord God, comes more clearer to our heart. When you said, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as some have done, Lord. For now we see the importance of coming together in unity, Lord God. We earn for that to come back, Lord God. For your words are sure and they are righteous. Father God, also, because of this door being shut, you're telling us other things too. You're asking your people to come back to you. Your message, Lord God, is to fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. The people, Lord God, you're pleading with us to come back to you, Lord God. You are saying, Lord, that if your people who are called by your name shall humble themselves and pray, that you will heal this land. So, Lord God, we are praying for all those who call themselves you by your name and say they're Christians, Lord God. We're praying, Lord God, that they would examine their hearts, Lord God, and see if they be in right fellowship with you, Lord God. You desire us to come, Lord God, and humbly, humbly, God, repent before you, to obey you, Lord, to obey your commandments, Lord, obey your laws, Lord God. Not with just word service, Lord God, that you desire heart service. Lord, you put those laws in for a reason. For to give us peace. Those are laws of liberty, Lord God. To have us living in harmony with you 
and with each other. You said, love the Lord with all thy heart and thy soul, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these hang the rest of the commandments, Lord. Those are the Ten Commandments, Lord, you put. There for a reason. And you also put, Lord God, your holy Sabbath day, Lord God. The seventh day, Lord as a day to come before you, Lord God, giving you thanks for your many bountiful goodnesses, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that those who are Christians, Lord, will look at the heart. All of us, Lord God, examine ourselves, Lord, that you may have mercy on us and heal this land, Lord God, and allow us, Lord God, not only to just come back to worship, Lord God, but to even come closer to fellowship to one another. Put aside petty differences, Lord, where we see that we have no time for that. For the time is near, we see, Lord, that you're arriving, your coming is right around the corner or right at the door. We know that this here pandemic is going to bring you glory. And this is the glory that you seek for your creation to come back to you. For, Lord, we know the thoughts that you have for us. You said, I have thoughts of good, not evil for you. Thoughts to have you of peace and a good uh, outcome. Even though we know, Lord, all these things work for the good, this is why you allow it. all things work for the good to those who love you who are called according to your purpose. We know, Lord. So, Lord, we thank you. We pray, Lord God, that you would now give us your spirit, Lord God, that we may be able to walk before you rightly, Lord that we may be able to obey your commandments, Lord, your laws, your statutes. We pray, Lord, that you pour your spirit in us, that we may preach, Lord, go out and teach people the truth about your word and your law. Not confuse you, Lord, with laws that have been nailed to the cross and laws that are binding. Lord, you have a kingdom, and every kingdom must have a constitution to govern it, and we know the commandments are your constitution. We thank you, Lord God, and as we wait on you, Lord, in your time, we know that you will do this, Lord God. For we can do nothing without you. You said we can do nothing without you. So we'll wait, Lord, patiently until you, Lord God, move. We will be still and wait on thee. Now, Lord, by we, Lord, we petition for those family members and friends, Lord, that lost loved ones in this time of maybe epidemic or just uh, a time of past. We pray for comfort and peace upon them, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, for family members, Lord God, to comfort them that's going through any trials and tribulations right now. For there are many things going on, we understand, Lord. Be with us in comfort. Give us your peace. Not the peace that, that the world, but your peace that you need, Lord. And Lord, we also ask, Lord, for special prayer for those uh, that's running the country, Lord. We're praying for our president. We're praying for those in authority of government, Lord. We ask that your Holy Spirit touch them, Lord, that they may uh, uh, look into your word, Lord God. Acknowledge you, Lord God, in their decisions, Lord God. To seek you, Lord God. This word, this country has passed over 35,000 laws, Lord, trying to, trying to govern and bring peace, Lord God, God. But they cannot bring peace. Peace only comes from Jesus, the Prince of Peace. So we're praying for our leaders, Lord God. And then, Lord, we're praying for your body, your body, the church here at the Boulevard, the leaders here. We thank you and praise you, Lord God, for giving us leaders, Lord God, that obey you and follow you, that they feed your sheep, Lord God. We thank you and we're praying for them and their family members, Lord. Lord, as we wait for you to open these doors, let us still be diligently doing our work, Lord God. You said, blessed is those who when I come, I find them doing their work. And if some of us shall sleep, you said those who sleep in you, they works do follow. You said also, Lord God, let us not grieve like those who have no hope. For we know that when Christ come, he will come and bring those who have slept in him those who have waited on him, we shall see our loved ones again. Lord, we just thank you for your many blessings, Lord. Be with us, Lord, as we try to go through this here pandemic, trusting in you, we will make it. 
Let us let our light shine in this world that we people may see our good works and glorify you, Lord. This is our prayer, Lord. In your name. Amen.
Thank you, dear Lord, we have to sit here.
It's getting better. Yep. In this life, as we deal with this pandemic, truly, it will get better. Because definitely, it's trying time right now. So thank you for that song. Because it will get better. Those who trust in God know that he promised that it will get better. Even though we may go through tough times now, even though there are things that happen that we can't explain, it will get better. So today we want to take a moment and share from the word of God about knowing the time. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we know that you love us. And in spite of all of the chaos that's happening around us, we ask that you would help us to place our attention on you and just pay attention to your word and be obedient in Jesus' name. Amen. Knowing the time, knowing the time. We want to talk a little bit from the book of Romans. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 1 through 11, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul has carefully explained the practical application of the doctrine of righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith means not only forgiveness of sin, but a new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, included in this righteousness, included is sanctification as well as justification. Included also is transformation as well as reconciliation. God, God's purpose is to restore the sinner, to restore you and me completely, to restore us completely in him, so that we might be fit to live in his presence. Amen. Hallelujah. And you think about the fact that God wants for us, his children, to live in his presence. What a marvelous thing. And that's why the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul says to us in Romans chapter 12 and verses 1, he says, I beseech you. Now think about it. I beseech you. In other words, he says, I beg you. I plead with you. I urge you, my brother and my sisters. He says, by the mercies of God that you would present your body a living sacrifice. But, but stop for a moment. Let's not look ahead. Let's stop for a moment and consider that word mercy. Now, when you look in the dictionary, the dictionary says mercy is a, a kind and a gentle treatment of an offender. And that's who I am. That's who we are. We have offended God. We have sinned. The Bible tells us that we have sinned. We have transgressed his law and we deserve death. Nothing else. Plain and simple. We deserve death. But because of the love of God. Hallelujah. Because of the love of God, God shows us mercy. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. But I love verse 17. He said that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It is God's desire to save us. But I like what Exodus 34 and verse 6 and 7 says, the Bible says in Exodus 34 that Moses had been talking with God. He had been listening at God. And he, he said to God, he said, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Can you imagine being so close to God that you say, Lord, I, I really want to see you. And, and, and God said to him, no man can see my face. 
place and live. But because you asked that, there's some rocks beside me. I'm going to set you in the cleft of the rock, and I'm going to hide you with my hand. And when I pass by, I'll let you see my back parts. The word says in Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7, it says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, he says, long-suffering and abundance in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But the verse go on and say, but by no means clearing the guilty and visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. God's mercy. The Bible says that God's mercy is eternal. Psalm says in Psalms 103 and verse 17, but the mercies of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to the children's children. It says God's mercy aboundness. Psalms 108 verse 4 says, for your mercies is great above the heavens and your truth reaches to the clouds. What a God we serve. God's mercies prolong life. Amen. Lamentation 3 and verse 22 and 23 says, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Amen. Amen. We are not consumed. He says, because his compassion fails not. They fail not. We have, a, we, we have experienced God's mercy this morning. We have experienced his compassion because he woke us up. What the long clock? Was it because the alarm clock rang and you woke up? What because the sun shined in your face and you woke up? It's because of God's mercy that he woke you this morning. And it says, they are new. Talking about God's mercy, his compassion. They are new every morning. And, and he says, great is your faithfulness. God's mercy encouraged repentance. Joel 2 and verse 13 says, So rent your heart and not your garment. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great kindness, and he relent from doing harm. Hallelujah. Amen. It says that God's mercy forgives sin. Micah 7 and verse 18 says, Who is a God like you? <laughs> Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Amen. God's mercy makes salvation possible. Titus 3 and verse 4 and 5 through 6 says, But when the kindness of the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. He says, but not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. He says, through the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. God's mercy. God's mercy is the reason that we hear. That's why Romans 12 and verse 1 go on to say, and that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable, Paul says. Reasonable. You see, to a large degree, the condition of our minds and soul depend upon the condition of our bodies. You see, Therefore, it is essential that the physical power be kept in the best possible condition, the best possible health and vigor. You see, any harmful practices, any harmful indulgence, any selfish indulgence that lessen the physical strength makes it more difficult for us to develop mentally and spiritually. When we are doing things that beclouds our mind, then we can't understand the word. 
We can't understand what God desired to teach to us. You see, the Bible lets us know that in the Old Testament time when a man or woman sinned, and they brought to God an animal to sacrifice. But when they brought that animal, that animal was examined. It was examined to make sure that it had no blemishes, no defects. And if there was a defect found, the animal was rejected. Likewise, you and I as God's children, you and I as Christians, are to present our bodies in the best possible condition as we can. All our faculties, all the power must be preserved, pure and holy, or either they are rejected. Rejected, not acceptable. Now, but you say, but, but wait, wait. What about that person who, who discovered God when, 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 who listened to God when, when they have been drunk out? They have been drunk out. Well, you see, God takes us as we are. When we recognize him and we accept him, God makes a promise to us, and he fulfills it. He cleanses us. He cleans us up. And when he cleans us up, set us on the right path, then he asks us to trust in him, and he asks us to follow him. And he makes it possible because, see, Sometimes we don't understand. We don't understand that we are God's temple. It's not about this building. This building tomorrow can become something totally different. Not a church. But we are God's temple. In us is where God desires to live. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Do you not know? that you are the temple of God and that, your, that his spirit dwells in you. Verse 17 goes on to say, if anyone dwell or defile the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? We are God's temple. And if we defile it by the things we put in or the things that we do to it, God will destroy us. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19 says, or Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Now I know many of us are told that when you reach that magic age of 18, that you are your own man. You are your own woman. You make your own but be mindful that the word of God tells us that we are God's property. Amen? We belong to him. Verse 20 goes on to say in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, he says, for you are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your bodies and in your spirit, which are God. We belong to him. If you go to the first chapter of your Bible, it says in the first chapter that God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. God created us. But we know the story by the time we get to chapter 3. Everything has fell apart. Man has fallen into sin. But God makes a promise in chapter 3, verse 15. He says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman between thy seed and her seed. So God makes a promise that I'm going to buy you back because you belong to me. So he made that promise. And in the New Testament, God demonstrated by coming in the likeness of man. Born as a baby, grew up in the sinful world, but yet did not sin. Hallelujah. Huh? Did not sin, but he was a perfect sacrifice. Died for your sins and mine. And then he said to us, I'll give you my life and I'll take yours. I've died for you. All you need to do is accept the gift and live forever. When we accept the gift, God says, now you have accepted the gift, I'll give you the power to live the way I want you to. 
because I know it's not in me. Hallelujah. What a God we serve. What a God we serve. Matter of fact, first, first Peter, first Peter in chapter 1, verse 18, Peter says that, that you, knowing, you need to understand this, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. Peter said nobody came to the auction block and said, I'll give 50 gold bars or 30 silver bars for him or her. God says, I have redeemed you with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That precious blood. That blood. Now the Bible says that, that washed me white as snow. That blood that, that says that no matter what sins I come to God with, he promised that he will redeem me and clean me up and I will be able to stand in the presence of God as I've never sinned before. That's what God promised. The second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16 says, and what agreement, <clears throat> and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living of God. You are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So we belong to him. So be mindful how we take care of this body. Romans 12 and verse 2 goes on to say, <clears throat> and do not be conformed to this world. See, Romans 1 is all, chapter 12 and verse 1 has already told us that we need to present our body, but he said, don't be conformed to the world. You see, without understanding it, sometimes we can be conformed. We can be conformed to the world by the way we eat. Because the world says that everything is good to eat. You can eat everything. But the word says, I've given you a diet, God says. A diet that you might be able to live a long and prosperous life. So everything that grows is not meant to be eaten. Every animal that walks the earth is not meant to be for food. God has given us a diet. A diet. And he gave us that diet in Genesis 1. In verse 29, that's where our diet is at. However, because of the flood, God permitted man to eat meat, but only certain ways. Leviticus chapter 11, Deuteronomy 14. Give us, give us our diet plan after the flood. The animals, the things that we are permitted to eat, God makes sure that you and I have no excuse. So we go to the word. Because the word is our roadmap. It's our roadmap to heaven. It's our roadmap to life eternal. And so we must work and follow it. We must be careful of the things that we drink. We must be careful how we dress. We must be careful the way we live. Because everything that we do should represent the God that we serve. How we work and the way we learn. You see, every book is not meant for me to read. I need to be careful because of the God that I serve. 1 John 2 and verse 15 through 17 says, he says, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now God didn't say hate the world. But he said don't love the world. There are things that God has given us to use for our use and for his glory. But we cannot become in love with those things. Now, we know that we need money to operate, but there's a way to use money, and then you can fall in love with money. That money then will begin to be your God, and God doesn't want money to become our God. He wants us to use it so that he, it might bless us and others and bring glory to God. He says, for in verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Verse 17 says, and the world is passing away. Amen. It's passing away. And the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That's a promise. So God wants us to use the things that he has provided for 
our good, the benefits of others, to bless them, but also to bring glory and honor to God. Now, the Bible makes it plain. God says, you know, I have cows on a thousand hills. If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. God doesn't need our money, but he understands that if we don't have a character like his, if we don't be uh, uh, loving like him, if we don't be merciful like him, if we don't have the, the charity that he has, we will fall in love with the things of the world and we will lose our life. The Bible goes on to say in Romans 12 and verse 2, finish said, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that's good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God has a way. He says that we need to be renewed in our mind. You see, the world has a way of thinking. The world has a way of doing business. And that's not God's way. That's not the way he would have his people to work. Ephesians 4 and verse 20 through 24 says, But you have not so learned Christ. He says, If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you pull off, or put off, you put off concerning your formal conduct. And the old man which grow corrupts according to the deceitful lust, he says, when you learn of Jesus as a follower of God, you put off the old man. No longer do you do business the way you used to do it. He says in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. As a child of God, there's a way that we do business. As a child of God, there's a way that we carry ourselves. As a child of God, there's a way that we talk to each other. And that is the way that God wants his people to operate. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says to us, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There's a way. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 6, he says that there is a way that, that in, in my old way I used to think of how I can get so that I can get more and I can have more and I can have more. But when I began to think like Jesus, I began to realize that all that he gives me, he gives me for a blessing to myself and those around me. He gives so that I might be like him to give to others, that I might be a blessing to those he brings in my path, so that I might be able to share the blessing that he gives. You see, the Bible lets us know that the more we give, the more that will be given to us. God tells us that it's a blessing to be a giver. He gives so that we can give to others so that they can know about the God that we serve. God loves us. He loves us, and he desperately wants us to demonstrate that love to those around us so that they might fall in love with Jesus, so that when he comes, he may take his children home and they might be a part of that group that go home to be with Jesus. So as we look at the time that we're living in, so as we understand what is happening around us, that we might be focused. We might not get caught up. We might not get lost in this pandemic. Yes, the virus is causing havoc in a lot of places. But God does not want us to get sidetracked. He doesn't want us to lose focus. He wants us to understand that people need him. And we need to be sharing that good news with them. That there's a God. There's a God who understands their condition. He knows what's happening in their lives. He knows what's going on in their home. It, it, it is no, no surprise to God about this pandemic. Yes, this pandemic caught a lot of people off guard, even though some were warned 
And they cut them off God. But not God. Not God. And because we are as his people, willing to follow him, he knows how to take care of us. He knows how to provide for us. When you look at all that is happening, yes, a lot of terrible things. But think about all the positive things that have come out of this. We have more people praying now than forever. We have more people now who are gathering on the phone and they are not talking about the craziness of the world. But they're talking about the goodness of God. They're talking about how God has brought them through things and they are praying where they didn't before. People are being drawn closer to the Lord. So let us, let us continue to lift up Jesus. And he says that if we lift him up, he will draw all mankind to him. So today, I pray that we will allow God to use us to bring glory and honor to him. So that those who have been in conversation with us today, tomorrow, the next day, might know that we serve a God who is able. He is able. Just like he brought the three Hebrew boys through the fiery furnace, he will bring us through. But if he choose, if he choose, if he choose to allow the fire to burn me up, it's all right because he has promised, he's promised that one day soon when he comes, even though I might be laying in the dusty grave, he's promised that he will blow the trumpet and that I will hear that trumpet and that I will get up in a newness of life be able to praise him throughout eternity. It's a promise that God has given to us. And God wants us to be there. So my prayer for us today is that we would hear the voice of God. We would understand the time that we are living and that we would be committed to serving God throughout eternity. Willing to sing praises to his name forever and ever. Let's pray together. Father, Thank you. Thank you for the promise that you will take care of us. Thank you, Father, for providing for us each and every day. You know exactly what we need, and you give it to us. So help us to trust you, to put our confidence in you, and allow you, Father, to lead and guide us. Thank you for your word that says to us that we should not be conformed to the world but that we should bring out, present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, which is our reasonable service. Thank you, in Jesus' name. service will close by singing from uh, hymn 223 and uh, after the hymn we will uh, dismiss uh, say the benediction don't forget 7 p.m. every day 7 to 8 join us on the prayer line God bless you
privilege of coming closer to you in worship and in praise. We thank you for accepting our praise. Thank you for accepting our worship. Thank you for everyone that is listening from their home and those who are here. We ask for special blessing upon each and every one of us. As we come close to the end of this week, we pray that your power will usher us into next week. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. Amen. So Lord, we put our faith and trust in you. We put our hand in yours, and we know you can see us through. Grant us your blessings. Sustain us physically, spiritually. Thank you for healing physically and spiritually. May your protection be upon each and every one of us. Once again, bless us abundantly. Take all the glory because we pray in Jesus' excellent name. Amen. Amen.